In the past year, family church staff and a lot of the leaders of life groups are studying this book called Gospel Fluency. It's what our life groups are going to be talking about this fall, and it's what we've been talking about for a year. And one thing I've learned through this process is that I'm an unbeliever. Now, before you gasp and run away and say, oh, I knew this was a problem, or before you say, why are you standing there with the Bible in front of you if you're an unbeliever, I'll tell you what else I learned. You're an unbeliever too. And I hadn't really wrestled with it, but the gospel for me was a story about what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago, and it was primarily for people who didn't know Jesus. It was a, a presentation to people who hadn't yet crossed the line of faith, and it was the, the vital, basic, foundational information. But I, I didn't really actually say it, but in some ways there was this perception that I'd already moved beyond that. And as we walk through this series, as we walk through this message today, I hope you will come to the same conclusion that we never get beyond that. That in fact, those things need to be in our heart and in our mind and in our conversation daily, in our life groups, in our, in our messages. And so we're going to do a series called The Gospel. Is it good news for you? And I want to explain right up front what the graphic is about. So I, I did a funeral um, yesterday. And I, I started off the message with, there are four huge questions that everybody has to ask and answer. And the answers you get determine your life and your destiny. So the first question is, where did it all come from? How do we get here? What's life about? What, what is it to be human and on earth? And the second question is, what is why are we in such a mess? Why is everything so messed up? Why, why is there so much pain and death and disease and ugliness and war? And the third question is, is there a solution to that? Is there anything that can help? What do we, what do we trust and put our hope in? And the last one is, if the solution is applied, how is it all going to turn out? And what you see here is, of course, the Bible's answers to those questions. Jesus' answers to those questions. And that is the good news that God created the world and that he has formed it in, in a perfect plan of his own, that the reason things are messed up is because there was a fruit in the garden that Adam and Eve rebelled against God and took. The solution is that Jesus has come, that we could have life and have eternal life. And lastly, if Jesus is given his way in our life, then we are going to participate in and experience the final new creation of all things, that ultimately God is summing all of history up in his incredible plan. So I want to talk to you about what does it mean to be a believer and what does it mean to be an unbeliever? And I want you to wrestle through that question personally for yourself this morning. And I'm going to start with a story from Mark chapter 9. If you have your Bible there or if you want to turn in your family church app, or in the U version, it's a story in Mark 9. And the backdrop is that Jesus has done something incredibly special. He's taken three of his disciples up on a little mountain there in the middle of Israel. And there it says he was transfigured, which means that instead of standing there in his humanness, his, his godness shone through. And it's, he was bright and shining, and he was talking with Moses and Elijah and it was Peter's great foot-in-the-mouth moment where he said, after, after the glory had faded, he said, we need to put three tabernacles, one for Jesus and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And, of course, he thought he was given Jesus amazing building, bill, bidding, excuse me, amazing picture if he was putting him with Moses and Elijah. He was, he was putting him up there with the top. And then all of the lights went out, and God the Father said, this is my son because they thought they were elevating Jesus, but in fact, they were elevating Moses and Elijah up to the same level as Jesus. It's a powerful statement of who Jesus is and who he was. And so they came down from that mountain, from the mountaintop, if you will, to the valley. And in the valley, the rest of the disciples were arguing with the teachers of the law, and there was this big fracas going on, and Jesus comes down and he tries to figure out what's going on. And what happened is they had brought a young boy who was 
they said he had a demon spirit. He was demonized, and he could neither speak nor, nor hear. And the disciples had tried to use their Jesus power, and they tried to cast out the demon, and they'd been trumped. They were flawed and failed. And so they're coming down, and they come to this mess. And so Jesus walks over, and he says, Oh, you unbelieving generation. He, he called them unbelievers. And then he said, how shall long shall I stay with you? Bring the boy to me. And then in verse 26, it says, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And the father answered, from childhood. It's often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I want you to hear those words there. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I hope you get that phrase right there because that's really the, the core of the message today. I think it really is an honest, powerful spiritual statement. I believe. Oh, Lord, help me overcome my belief, my unbelief, that even though I can state emphatically that I'm a follower of Jesus and I do believe, boy, there are so many things that my life shows and my relationship show and my, my feelings show that I haven't fully believed everything that God has told us. So I want us to walk real quickly and real clearly through what it means to have saving faith because it's quite possible that you're here and just kicking the tires and maybe you're visiting church or maybe you've been in church for a long time. And if I asked you point blank, are you sure that if you died right now, your next breath would be in heaven because you are so sure of your relationship with Jesus? And if there's any doubt in your heart at all when I ask that, then listen carefully because this is a simple running through what faith is required to transfer me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to save me. And it starts in a very simple verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is often, a, if only one verse is used, this is often the verse we talk about when, when somebody wants to know about have a life in Jesus that's transformed by him. And it says very, very, very clearly that it is belief in Jesus that brings us to the point of salvation. But many people say, well, I believe in God. I believe Jesus lived. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? And so I want us to run back and look at those four questions I asked at the funeral and say, saving faith acknowledges the gospel answer to those four questions. Where did everything come from? It was created by a loving God. In fact, the Bible very clearly says that God is a trinity and that that triune God is both holy and loving and he created human beings in a very, very special way. In Genesis 1, it talks about the fact that we are created in God's image. In fact, it's, a, it's an interesting, if you read it carefully, it, it says God says, let us create man in our image using the plural. So clearly from the very big first chapters, it talks about God being a trinity, and then it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So the gospel answer to that question is that God not only created everything, God created me. And I might just make a side note, it says male and female, he created them. <laughs> that that was God's idea to assign gender, that that's his role, and also that men and women together reflect the image of God and that there is a beauty in that picture. And so that's the gospel answer, which is the good news answer to that question. And then the, the second answer to the question, why is this world such a mess? Why is there war and disease and death and hatred and ugliness? And the, the answer that the Bible gives is, I am separated from God by sin that just like Adam and Eve chose in the garden 
to rebel against God. You see, God had given them a whole garden full of beautiful things and totally everything they needed. And then Satan came along and he whispered, God is holding out on you. I have a better plan. In fact, he says to him, God doesn't want you to eat of the, knowledge of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he knows you will become like God. You see, the, the core issue of sin is that I want to ignore God and I want to do my own thing. I want to choose what's right and wrong. I want to choose my life. I want to choose what I want to do. Then in essence, I want to be God for myself. And that separates us from God because we can't acknowledge God as God if we want to be God ourselves. And so that separates us from God and that, that causes sin to flood in in all kinds of other ways. But that's the core of it. And the Bible says, in Romans 3.23, that righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe again. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's talking to very religious Jewish people, very pagan Gentile people. He said they have the same problem, that they have fallen short of God's glory. They're separated from him. And the only solution is to believe in Jesus Christ. And then we get forgiveness and his righteousness, his character is given to us. So the third question, remember the first question is where did it all come from? The second question is why is it such a mess? The third question is what's the solution to this problem? And of course if you know anything about a relationship with Christ or the Bible, that it's Jesus' sacrifice is the only solution because Jesus came as perfect God and perfect man and because he lived a a perfect sinless life here on earth, he was able to take my place and say, for Paul Glazner's sins, for his separation from God, I am going to die on the cross. And his death, in some way that we don't fully understand, substituted for me, and I am able to partake of his goodness and be connected to the Father. Because in Jesus, I can be completely holy. I can be made righteous. And so, that is shown to us in John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It's interesting how many people admire Jesus, even people from other religions and other, other faith base that would answer those four questions differently. And yet they admire Jesus until he says things like this. They might even say he's the way, but they wouldn't say no one comes to the Father except through him. He is the only gate. He is the only way. And that means that that's good news when we find out about Jesus and find out that simple belief in him can take away all of our guilt and shame and restore us to a relationship with God. That is incredible news. And the fourth question is, how is it all going to turn out? What's going to happen if, if I give my life to Jesus, if I believe in him, if I, if I confess that he's my Lord and master, and if I believe that Everything the Bible says about Jesus is true, that, that he died and his sacrifice paid for my sin and he was raised from the dead to show that it worked. What if I believe that? Well, what happens is God is making a new creation, that God is the restoring of all things. No matter how much of a mess it looks like right now, God is working all of the universe together for all of time to bring together at the end an incredible new creation. And it starts personally 2 Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. So the first thing that happens when I submit myself to Jesus' lordship, to him being the boss, when I confess my sins, when I believe in Jesus, that I am transformed. And it's not just like I change a, a choice from vanilla to chocolate. It's like going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that God transforms me. And he says, if you can understand it, if you can believe it, that the old is gone, I'm done with that. And the new, he does a new creation in us. And that's just the beginning. You see, salvation is not just a personal thing, it is a planetary thing. I love this last verse in Revelation where it says, he who is seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. And then he says, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And Revelation talks about how all of history is going to be summed up to be bringing glory to God and for us to be with him forever and ever and ever. That 
is the gospel. That is the, the good news of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And some of you have said, I, I believe that and I've walked through that, but I keep messing up or maybe I've walked away from church and maybe I've walked away from, from God. And the, the good part about being a believer is that the scripture clearly says at times strong and severe warnings, which has caused some people to believe that their salvation is kind of a on again, off again. I can lose it. But the wonderful truth is that once God has made a new creation in us, it is an irreversible process. I love this verse from John. It says, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that a great picture? That Satan and Jesus are going head to head, and once I commit my life to Jesus, he grabs hold of me, and I... I flop back and forth and I fail and I go ahead in faith and I step back in unbelief. But Jesus never lets go. In fact, he says, I dare you. Nobody can snatch him out of my hand. And so the wonderful truth is that if we believe this good news, it changes everything for all time. That's what it means to be a believer. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's, that's what it means to be like this father that says, I believe and so I would ask you before we go any further, as I walk through that, and I know that was a lot of scripture, and in fact, if you read through the devotions this week, you'll, you'll have a chance to walk through some of those more slowly. But if there's any doubt in your mind at all, I'd love to talk to you, and I encourage you to talk to a trusted friend who is a follower of Jesus, because I want you to not only know the truth, I want the truth to set you free. So that's the first part. The second part is a little more challenging, which is... I am also an unbeliever. And this is really what we're going to try to address in this series. Not that you're lost and we need to try to get you to pray a prayer for salvation, but that you have come to believe in Jesus, but we still are with that Father saying, help my unbelief. And in order for God to answer that prayer, we have to be honest about our unbelief. I hope that church becomes a place where it's safe to say, I'm wrestling with doubt. I'm struggling with this. I, I know that's what the Bible says, but I, I'm having some issues. And I don't mean unbelief. It's like, I don't think that's true. But we wrestle in lots of ways. So where are the sources of our unbelief? And I want to walk through a couple of them, and maybe you're, you can identify with some of these of why you might be an unbeliever. Let me give you a personal example first. So as we were walking through this whole idea of gospel fluency and that the gospel is for every day, I realized that I am the first, the, the oldest child, the first son, and, and so I was raised to be highly responsible, which means I often feel guilty for things I haven't gotten handled or fixed or taken care of, or, or if, I, if other people don't do it, I still need to, to take care of them. And because that was the foundation core of my heart, that makes it really tough to be a pastor. Because almost every decision we make in leadership, uh, somebody doesn't like, somebody wishes we'd have done church differently, somebody wants to criticize or just, you know, up and leave. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where somebody explains to me that even though they've been for here for years and they love me and they, they were greatly in, enhanced by the church ministry, that they're leaving and it never doesn't hurt. And every time those threats would come up, it would, be, it would make me insecure about, oh, if I were just smarter, if I were just more spiritual, if I were just a better pastor, if I were a better leader, maybe this wouldn't happen. And so sometimes I pulled back, and I didn't lead courageously, and sometimes I, I, I tried to please people when I was clear that God had led me somewhere. And as we walked through this series... I really came to face the fact that if I'm accepted and I'm a, I have an identity of a child of God and that if he's given his life for me and if I'm a new creation and, and if he's walking with me and this Holy Spirit is in me, if, if that's true, then I don't have to live in fear of what people will do or what people will think. And I am not saying I got that handled. I'm saying this was a great step forward in that. 
And I wish I'd been more confident in that in some of the decisions or non-decisions that I've made. But let me ask you some of the hindrances in your life. One of them is ignorance. Sometimes that's part of our teaching ministry. That's part of what our life groups do. It's part of helping people to understand the truth. Jesus said, if you'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so there's just a, a whole long process when somebody comes to faith. I mean, the Bible is a big book, and to get an accurate picture of, of God in His majesty and His holiness and His hatred of sin and His love for us, to get all of that, even, even just to get all the stories down, it takes a lot of effort, and, and more and more and more, it's like pixels filling in. We get a clearer and clearer picture of, of God and His plan for us. And so some of it, it just takes an, a long time to really understand all that God has said and what, what that means and what that means for me. So part of it is just that we need the truth. We need to teach the gospel in our, in our services and we need to, to teach the gospel to ourselves and we need to talk about it with our friends. We need, we need to get clear about the truth. And the other part of the truth is that we need to admit what's really going on inside of us. I, I grew up in the church and it's never, never, never stated but the strong influence is you better look good. In fact, sometimes when people admitted doubt or admitted sin or admitted fault, there was all these righteous people around them to give great advice. And man, I, I, in my mind, the, the words that, that work for me is I never want to be a project. <laughs> I don't want to share what's going on inside of me because I'm going to get pounced on by 40 people with big Bibles and telling me all the words of truth. And because of that, I think that we have a great tendency to hide. I, I like to hide. I like to share about things that happened a long time ago and not things that are going on right now. In my prayer request, it's easy to pray for other people instead of being honest. Uh, and I remember the first time in a prayer meeting, I, I finally had the courage to say, you know, I'm discouraged. This was a tough time. And you think, wow, that's, <laughs> that's nothing, Paul. It was hard for me to say. Why? Because I think we get the idea that not that Christ makes us good, but that we have to make ourselves good and we have to look good if we aren't. Or in the old phrase, fake it till you make it. And so I think this series, and I hope this message will help you honestly look at where don't I really believe God? Where do I take the words of Scripture? And I, I think it's somehow for a long time ago and not for right now. And so we're going to walk through how can I overcome that? And, and if you understand, and we're going to walk through in this series a, a thing called fruit to root where, where I see things in my life. Like if God made me and he knows just how he formed me, why am I so insecure about my hair color and my height and my weight and my size? And why, why am I so focused on that if, if God says I'm good? Why, why do I struggle with people labeling me and calling me names or criticizing me if the labels on my deepest heart are that I'm loved and I'm identified as a child of God and that, that He has created me to be holy in His sight. I mean, if I really live in that, then those other things kind of bounce off. And I think as we walk through this, you'll see there's lots of fruit in our life that says, ah, I don't think you really believe what you say you believe. And so I hope that is a positive and wonderful experience for you. I think there's another thing that sometimes goes underneath that is that not only does my insecurity and my language and the way I change about who I'm with different, I'm different with different people, but often the Spirit of God begins to surface core lies in our hearts. Things that are so deep we don't even really realize we believe them, but they drive us. And until the Spirit of God surfaces them, and then we can say, oh, God, you're right. That is wrong. Please take that away. I want to believe the truth instead of the lie. Let me give you an example. Millard Fillmore, who is the, the person who started Habitat for Humanity, says that he grew up in the church, and he would go and hear sermons about how the love of money was the root of all evil and about, about how it was easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. And he heard those words, but he had come to believe an American core lie, which is that it's really money and power 
and luxury and success. That's what makes you happy. That's what makes your life. So he said, I am going to pursue being rich with all of my heart, and I'm still going to try to get into heaven because I like a challenge. I'm going I'm to try to do them both. And, and I think that's a good example. If I have a core lie that money is happiness, then I have to surrender that to the God who said, actually, money is dangerous. That the love of money is a big problem. I think there's other kinds of core lies. We talked about people putting labels on us. And almost everybody has somebody in their life, a parent or somebody in junior high who said, you're dumb or you'll never amount to something or I can't believe that you're even here. You're, you're not up to our class. And we wear those labels inside of us where nobody can see. And the wonderful news is that the gospel can set us free from that, that we can be relabeled, that we can believe different things. But first you have to admit this is the core lie that I wrestle with, and that's hard to do. The third reason I think we don't really let the truth set us free is that we're not fully trusting in it. That we know it's there, we may even believe it with our head, but it's hard to lean on it. And let me show you how this might work for you. So in the Grand Canyon, there's a special place where you can go out on this circular walkway and you are 4,000 feet above the valley floor. So you can look down and you can see this because the bottom of it is clear glass. And you are 4,000 feet up, and here you can see it from the side. There is nothing but straight down once you get out there to the end. And they'll tell you all kinds of reassuring things like this bridge is strong enough to hold 70 747 airplanes. Now that's a little more than you weigh. So you can hear all about that. But when you walk out there, and it's actually, I've seen funny videos of when people walk out there, they don't want to walk on the glass. They want to walk over on the metal over here because I can see through that. And no matter how much you tell me it's strong, I am not going to trust it. And I think that's a picture of how we often take what God says to us. It's like, I believe it. Intellectually, I know that glass bridge is completely safe. But in the, the real life that I live, <laughs> I'm going to crawl over by the edge and I'm not taking any chances. And isn't that a wonderful picture that if we were actually set free by the truth, we could walk on the glass without fear? That we could live a life of trusting in God, which leads to peace no matter what goes on in our life? And I think this is kind of funny. This is a little 70-foot jaunt out over the cliff. If you really think you're ready to try your faith, well, there, here's a glass bridge in China that goes way across the gorge, and there's no hope if you're out there in the middle. And they say when you walk across it, it kind of crackles. And I hope that as you grow in your faith, as you come to admit you're an unbeliever and let God begin to heal your unbelief, that you'll be able to walk that walk of faith there's a last reason where I think we are not able to fully put our, our weight into the truth, and that is past trauma and brokenness. I've heard stories, many, many stories of people who suffered terrible things in their childhood or in their first marriage or in some process of their life. They were abused, and because of that, they feel shame, they feel wounded, they feel guilty. And so when the, the, that, that's core to their life, that wound has gripped them. And so when they hear things like God has a plan for you, like God loves you, like God has given you spiritual gifts, like God's going to do wonderful things in your life, there's that inner belief in their heart that's like, that's for somebody else. You don't know where I've been. Sometimes it's the opposite. It's the terrible things that we've done. That in my days before I came to Christ, I... I was involved in so many things that hurt so many people and were so awful and, and in fact they come up to my memory every now and again. And I know that Jesus talks about forgiveness, but how could he really forgive? And maybe even deeper, I don't feel forgiven. And so God, I think, has to go through a process of healing us to bring the truth that we know into a truth that we feel, a truth that we can live in, a truth that we can combat 
those flashbacks, those, those lies. One of, one of Satan's titles is he's the accuser of the brethren. And he loves to, to dance on some sore spot in our soul and try to convince us that Jesus is a liar when in fact he's a liar. I, I think that there's lots of reasons that we wrestle with unbelief, that I wrestle with unbelief. And my hope is that through this series, you will be able to say, Lord, I believe, I'm clear about that, I've been saved and I'm secure and I'm not, I'm not wrestling with that, but help me grow out of my unbelief. I read in a good book one time a, a person who was struggling with doubt and they were not yet ready to trust Christ and, and so they were coming to church and they were listening and they were going through all this process, but, but they still were so caught with doubts about the Bible and about who God says he is. And one day they came to the pastor and they said, you know what, I don't know how it flipped in my head, but, but somehow I think that God's been working in me because this week I decided that instead of living in my doubts and occasionally visiting the truth, I want to live in the truth and even if I occasionally visit my doubts. And I think that's such a powerful picture of, Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief and help me to restate again what is true and what is real so that I can put my full weight on it so that my life can be filled with peace and with confidence and with a sense of God's leading me in purpose. And I hope that's your experience as well. And as we go through this series, I, I would encourage you to read the Gospel Fluency book if you're a reader, if you'd like to do that. Be a part of a life group where we're talking through these things at a very deep level and talking through them is so helpful. And I would encourage you to open up in your honest relationship with God and tell Him what's really going on in your heart and you will find that the truth does set you free. I'm going to release to the campus pastors and those of you who are online and I encourage you to to take a moment and say, what is God saying to me out of this? Don't just walk away, but let God challenge you with this message. Thanks for joining us. Love you. Bye.